Good morning, and welcome to another weekly live session with Coastal Drone. This is our ninth episode in a row, so golf claps, golf claps all around. My name is Ian Wells. We've got Jim Bachelot and Finn Leahy with me today. We are going to be doing a live advanced operations site survey for any drone operation in Canada. And this is going to go further to my rant that we had a week or two ago. Any drone operation, you need to know where you're going to be flying your drone. You need to know a bunch of different things we're going to go through today. It's CARS, Canadian Aviation Regulations, 901.27. And you must conduct a site survey if you're going to fly a drone that is 250 grams or more in Canada. I say do it for everything, not just 250 grams. So what we're going to do today is we're going to step through an example scenario. And we're going to do a live site survey using the tools that we typically use as drone pilots in order to determine what's required and what we need to do in order to fly in that airspace. So Ian asked me to write a scenario. So this is the scenario that I came up with. Part of the reason why we picked this scenario is when we get into nav drone or the, the nav drone map, we're going to see some interesting things about Vancouver now. So the scenario is a member of the Jericho Sailing Club. This is like a catamaran club here in Metro Vancouver. Um, has approached you to get cinematic drone shots of them sailing in the Burrard Inlet. They have received permission from the center for you for you to use their dock facilities for takeoff and landing. So already we've got one thing checked off. Next, there's a couple more informations. They are able to sail out about a maximum of two kilometers for the sh um, from the shore, and they plan to stay in about a loose box, and then when they come back, they're going to follow the shore line back to the dock. Um, your mini drone is snagged. Rats. We'll see why that's rats in a moment. Um, I think the next slide is just the, so there's the sailing club at the bottom there, and then this is the maximum extent that they would, that they that this person can go in their boat. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the maximum extent the drone can go. This is just the maximum extent that the person in the boat is going to go. This is their plan. This is their plan, exactly. What kind of shots do they want? Uh, that's in the uh, next slide. They want low shots, high shots, and adhere shots. Okay. And they would um, like all the filming to conclude within one hour. And then, so if I'm playing the role of drone service provider, mm -hmm. um, and you're the customer, mm -hmm. uh, do you want video or photos? Video, please. Video. Okay. And is there any particular, like, look or anything that you want? I want it to, uh, this, this is a, a real client. I want it to look cool. Okay. <laughs> um, Valid. So you think in, like, sunset shots, middle of the day? I Probably sunset shots. Okay, cool. All right. And... So any any particular boat or anything in this is like it's it's a fleet of oh, like a regatta or or I'm going to be sailing a catamaran and I want videos of me sailing the catamaran. Oh, you in particular? Yes, me in particular. Okay, so there's there's a specific mm -hmm. boat that I need to focus in on. Yes, okay. I should you know you probably won't see another boat. It should just be me. We'll go. We can go out and you can just follow me with the drone. Great. Um, can I join you on the boat for this? Um, it is if if you do join me on the boat, you'd have to like put on a wetsuit and like I I would recommend not just because if um it, it's like have you been in one of these small catamarans? There are two people and you basically have to be standing the whole oh, time okay. and holding onto the riggings. So you can join me if you want. I just don't think it will mean that you will fly the drone very good. Cozy. Okay, that's good to qualify uh, mm -hmm. how big the boat is. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it's like a 40-foot catamaran. Mm -hmm. So No, this is like one of those one- to two-person catamarans. Okay, that's that's really important to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, and did you have like a budget in mind for this? Um, yeah, so so uh, I've seen that your I've seen your call-out fee before. And I'm happy to do that. And I just want the it to conclude within one hour because I'm also renting the boat by the hour as well. So if we can do everything within an hour, um, I know that that doesn't give us a ton of time, but like, uh, I think that that should be sufficient. At the end of the day, I, um, I'm going to take this footage and cut maybe a 90 second video. Okay. And you're going to take care of the editing yourself? Yes. Okay. That's good to know. Awesome. So essentially, you need me to film some sunset shots mm -hmm. in a... 16 foot ish sailboat mm -hmm. at, at the location we've already discussed, mm -hmm. and budget seems to be okay. Mm -hmm. We're not going to talk like actual money for this because mm -hmm. that would kind of confuse everything yep. for what we're doing today. But just like that's a natural point in the conversation. If you haven't already booked the job, knowing what their budget expectations are is important um, before you go down the road of site survey and everything mm -hmm. else. So we kind of assumed that was done. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, just clarifying what kind of shots, right? You've given me some mm -hmm. points and you basically want the boat to look cool and focus on one particular boat. Mm -hmm. 
And and great. And we're going to plan for an evening when the weather's good. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So we've we've reiterated what your expectations are, mm-hmm. so that we're clear on our language and contract would go out and everything else. So, um, all right. So all that's done. The deposit's been paid. All of that's good. Insurance. Everything is is all sorted out for the job. Um, all right. So it's up to me now to do this job and get paid for it. So um, let's establish a scenario. I have in my fleet a Mavic 3 drone. It's got a telephoto lens and a wide angle lens. I think that'd be great for it. It's got 45 minutes of battery life. It's got really good range, really good. And it's um, probably going to be the most likely the drone I'm going to use for this. Right. So I can shoot 5K video and I can shoot stills on the fly. Um, and that's kind of my workhorse drone. So that's what I need to use. The drone weighs about 900 grams. So it is going to be most likely either a basic or an advanced operation. It's not a micro drone. As you said, it's going to be snag. So I have to plan based on that. I'm going to start with what the requirements are for a site survey, because that's what we're doing today. So I'm pulling this from the Transport Canada Aeronautical Information Manual. And this is the second edition for 2023. The first edition for 24 is probably a couple weeks away yet. I think it's mid-March. So, and what we're looking for is the site survey requirements. So, like I said, every drone operation in Canada needs to start with a site survey some way or another. You need to know what you're going to be going into. So, we start at 3215.1, the understanding your area of operation, right? That's the goal of all of this. The the Transport Canada CARS reg is 901.27, which is you must do a site survey. This, when you look at the aeronautical information manual, it's a interpretation or a plain language version of the cars, right? So the goal is to understand what that reg says. You come back to the AIM to, to get some more insight and actually procedures and processes. So like you'll never see the word Google Earth in Canadian aviation regulations, but here it is in here, right? So, um, so it's important to understand the area of operation prior to conducting your mission. Um, there's lots of options out there. So I mentioned satellite imagery, topo maps, visiting the site in person is a good option. Um, there's tons of freely available satellite imagery out there, right? There's Google Earth and Bing. There's GeoGratis, uh, which is part of National Resource Canada. Um, Nav Canada has maps available for free. And there's also some aviation charts available if you want to purchase them through Nav Canada. Or there are third-party apps that offer them for free. Uh, it does point out that you need to make sure that if you're using a third-party app, it, it is a official NAV Canada source because if you make aviation regulation decisions based on something that is not officially supported, you are throwing your own paddle up Boo Creek. So um, it's up to you as pilot in command. So it's best to use the site coordinates in order to localize the area of operation on a map or other imagery, right? That just means... Find the spot you're going to fly, center in on that spot, and look at that spot and make sure that it makes sense to you. If you don't have coordinates, use a landmark nearby structure point of reference. This is called dead reckoning, right? So I see a tree. Is that the tree I'm talking about, or is this the tree? Well, how about we use this bridge? There's only one bridge in this spot. So once a site has been identified, these are the steps that need to be followed. And here's the funny thing. So CARS 90127 has letters A through H. In the AIM, there's more. So we need to define our operation boundaries, which is how far out are we going to go, right? What's the altitude? What's the distance from our takeoff location? What is that going to be? We need to figure out what the airspace class is and what the applicable regulations are in that airspace. The routes and altitudes to be followed while we're doing the operation. So how high am I going to fly the drone and how far or where am I going to go, right? Proximity of manned aircraft and or other aerodromes. What's the nearest aerodrome to where we're flying? What manned aircraft potentially could be sharing the same airspace as where we're flying that drone? The location and height of nearby obstacles, so towers, bridges, trees, buildings, you name it, power lines, right? Cranes. Cranes. And that, the next one, the F, this is also not in the cars. Yeah, so then security warnings, security measures for warning the public of the RPAS operation. I think this is an interpretation of minimum safe distance from people. But it also says that. Oh, it does. <laughs> Yeah, that's, this is what happened. We're reading this. <laughs> that's weird. So, yeah, security measures for warning the public. So how do you cordon off your area of operation, right? So predominant weather conditions for the area. Um, is it going to be above what the 
maximum limits are for the drone you want to fly. Minimum separation distance for persons. Okay, so that comes back to advanced operation and or your takeoff and landing spot. Mm -hmm. uh, alternate landing site in case of precautionary emergency landing. And then this this one was, so aviation maps and symbols is a new one for me. Um, I'll admit I've read 9127 probably 500 times and I've read this passage in the AIM. Not as many. And J is a new one to me. What do you think they mean by that? Just read the map and know what they mean on the map. Oh, okay. So that's interesting that they've gone to that. And so the reason we're saying it's interesting is typically when a change comes up in the AIM, it's going to be highlighted in blue. So that means this is white. It's been in for a couple editions. And I haven't seen it in a couple editions because we've done a review of the AIM changes probably four times in a row over the last two, three years. Mm -hmm. So... That's been there a while, so that's interesting, and I learned something new right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not going to say shame on me, but yeah. So we know what we need to do. Let's open up some tools, and we're going to do our preliminary, right? So we know we're going uh, back to the Yacht Club Spanish Banks Beach. Okay, so let's, I'm going to change my... I don't think it's the, uh, so there's the Yacht Club and then the Sailing Club. They're next door to each other. Okay, so I'm going to just bring up, I'm going to share... Uh, map.navdrone.ca. Okay, I use, so this is my process for my site survey. I start with map.navdrone.ca for any operation that I think is going to potentially require a more than uh, cursory site survey. And when I say cursory site survey, what I mean on that is it's a known location I've flown lots. I've already done an extensive site survey and I've confirmed what the regulations are. So my final steps are going to be looking at notice system airmen, right? If there's any airspace regulation changes, weather, um, and then any kind of last minute surprises, right? So I'll do a, a quick look at it. When I want to look at a totally new location, say I'm bidding on the job, right? Can I even do the job, right? Someone says, oh, I want to go downtown Vancouver. Well, okay, let's find out first before we, we talk numbers, right? Is it feasible? So you open map.navdrone.ca, no login is required, um, and this is what you see when you log in. By default, it switches to a uh, basic operations on the right side here, and everything is turned on. So what that means is if I zoom out, all of these red areas are areas that a basic pilot cannot fly, right? So either uh, within one nautical mile of a hospital heliport, or within three nautical miles, or the edge of the control zone for uh, an airport. Right? So in the case of Vancouver, all of this is red because it's controlled airspace. For a basic pilot, that is not allowed. So we're going to Kitts Beach, and we can go, well, we don't know the, uh, to the west. I can go, and then in the bottom right here on the screen, I can go to change my view, and let's go satellite with labels. And where is it? That one? Um, not the, the it's the, yeah, Jericho. The, the, the sailing center right there. Okay, so I'll drop a pin right there. It's Jericho Sailing Center. And when I drop a pin on it, it tells me first off why it's red, and it's a control zone, so controlled airspace. From the ground, the lower limit, up to 2,500 feet above sea level or above mean sea level, AMSL. Who is the contact? Who owns that airspace? Nav Canada, of course, because it's standard controlled airspace. I don't know what type of airspace it is at this point. It doesn't matter. It's controlled airspace. As a basic pilot, I wouldn't be able to fly a 250 gram or more drone here without getting my advanced. So immediately I know I can't use a micro drone here because I don't have one. Um... So now I need to go and get my mini, or sorry, my Mavic 3 out and get ready to fly as an advanced operation. So let's switch to the layers here and we're going to change my layers as advanced. And now it changes the way the map looks, right? So we've got some different shading here. And I'm going to zoom back out because this is actually pretty unique on nav drone to Vancouver. I think Vancouver right now is the pilot for this. No one else has this feature. But what you'll see is there's a bunch of weird-shaped polygons around the land in Vancouver. 
And then just to the south, you've got this grid system. This grid system with the orange squares is what Navdrone has been traditionally since it was introduced in 2021, where you would have uh, initially a one kilometer by one kilometer square of grid that you would apply for permission to fly a drone in that under advanced operations. And the, the shading of the grid would mean how high you can fly automatically with permission as long as everything was met on the condition side. Now, so for example, if I click down here in point gray, it would say lower limit ground, upper limit 400 feet. If I went farther or closer to the airport, um, the grid, because there's some overlapping circles here, will be a little more confusing, but you go from grid here, it's now lower limit surface to 200 feet, which means if I asked for 200 feet to fly the drone, as long as I was an advanced pilot and had the right aircraft and everything else, um, I would be automatically approved for that spot. No, no human would stop me from flying there until I did something wrong. But now what they've done is they've gone into Vancouver and assessed the traffic hazard in the area, and they've changed the way the system works. So all of English Bay, if I click on English Bay, is ground to the ground. That means that no one can automatically fly a drone out over the water at any altitude without a human looking at it, right? So if you want me to go out onto the water for this job, Mr. Customer, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to need a little more than 24 hours notice is, is what this immediately tells me with my cursory site survey. Um, at the moment, Nav Canada, and the last time I looked on the site, I think it was 36 to 72 hours for, for non-automatic approvals is what their standard is. It could be less, it could be more. Um, sometimes I've seen really fast service. Sometimes I've seen not so fast service. It's based on workload and demand and staffing and everything. So, um, but if I zoom in, I can also see that on the shoreline, I'm allowed up to 200 feet. Now, based on what you'd given me for a map there, I don't think that's enough, right? That's, uh, one kilometer out by three kilometers. So if I go back into Nav Drone Viewer and we say we're leaving from here and there are some cool tools in here, uh, where is the measure distance tool gone? Maybe it's not on the map. Maybe we got to wait till we get into the portal. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. But we know that these boxes now are 500 meters. They've, they've cut these boxes in the grid down. So if I look at that, that's... a thousand meters there so that means we're probably out to about here so we're definitely into the the surface surface um box so what that's told me right now is it's classy airspace well sorry i don't know it's classy airspace i just spilled the beans but again it doesn't matter it's controlled airspace mm -hmm. we're going to switch over to the portal and we're going to make an application to fly in this area because that's i have to do that and i can conclude the rest of my site survey while doing that right so We've looked at the boundaries of the operation already. We just haven't drawn them. Okay, so this is the portal version of Nav Drone. The portal version and the map version have the exact same functionality when it comes to the initial cursory site survey, but of course, you have to log in to be able to get to this view. So um, it's an extra step that may or may not be necessary. So um, if you don't... The reality is if you if you know you're not in controlled airspace, um, there is no mandatory requirement to do a nav drone submission request for a uncontrolled airspace operation. It's still a good idea to do it because now you've got one tool that you're logging, doing your site survey, all your planning and everything is in one spot. So it is, I do recommend doing it. But again, like if you're running a micro, you can use map.navdrone to do your micro site survey but there is no requirement for logging. There's no requirement for any of this. So, so it holds all of your previous. Yeah, 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 exactly. So when we look at the portal here, um, I've got dashboard gear, users, operations, flight map, and logbook. Um, if I go to operations, I can see every other flight that I've done, done yeah. right? So whether they're real or fake or training or whatever, they would show up in here. When they were done, um, what aircraft, what the details of it was, <laughs> Uh, the logbook feature only tracks flights if you hit the takeoff and landing button. I think I hit the takeoff button and then never hit the landing button because apparently I've got 41 hours in Nav Drone. <laughs> and that, that's not what my actual drone time, which is actually way more, but it's also not 
there's no there's no correlation between what's in here and what your DJI flight logs have. Logging, yeah. yeah. You have to manually do this. Mm-hmm. So it's good practice though, right? It is it's it's required. Yeah. It is required that you track your takeoff and landing time somehow. A lot of drones do it automatically for you, but if they don't, you have to do it manually. Right. So and we recommend that you track them manually anyways. Yeah. Because mm. what if something gets uh, blocked or banned or um, a company goes bust and then the servers are just done? Exactly. Mm. I think we'll do another. We did the maintenance tracking side recently, but mm-hmm. we didn't really talk about the operations mm-hmm. side. So. so I know I need to make an application, which means I need to create an operation in Nav Drone. So we're going to go to create operation. And it brings up the map. I always recommend just going right to create operation instead of going to the map first because it's going to reset your map to all of Canada anyway. Okay, so that's our spot. When I click on a spot and drop a pin, it tells you what the details are about that spot. Right? So at this point, it's Vancouver Harbor. We're in CYHC control zone, which is north of mm. Vancouver. Um, again, I have no idea what letter it is. Not that relevant. To drones. It is important when you're doing the test and when you you have general knowledge of what the types of airspace are, because at some point they will be. But for what we're doing right now, they're not. It's is it controlled airspace? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So we know it's controlled airspace. We know we approximately need um let's say Let's just draw a zone for our operation. So if we start here and we give ourselves a berth, is that going to be enough? And you double click to finish your polygon. Uh, So let's go back to one kilometer out, three kilometers east of the spot. Yeah, one kilometer out, three kilometers east. Wrong tab, wrong tab. So there is a there is a measurement tool in here. You probably have to go back to the map viewer to use it again. Maybe, yeah. Ugh. <laughs> this is fine. Don't worry about this it. This is fine. Okay. <laughs> it's probably enough. The reality of it is I can make the circle huge because mm-hmm. all of this is the same block of airspace. And because we're out of over water, we've got some more stuff to talk about anyway. But let's just say that's big enough for the spot. So I've set my polygon in my area of operation. Um... We're chasing a boat. Realistically, I don't need more than a hundred feet, right? I, I let's let's set my parameter name. So this is uh-huh. um, yeah, <laughs> sailing vessel. <laughs> and that'll be written uh, up operation. on the contract too. Yeah, yeah. sailing. Sailing shots. Uh, Category of operation. Well, obviously, it's advanced. As soon as I click advanced here, it's going to switch the map, right? So now we can see all the different areas that we've asked for for takeoff and landing, right? And the activity is going to be filming, aerial filming, photo videography. Operation type is going to be visual line of sight. Let's say the start time is going to be, oh, wait, yeah, it doesn't really matter. 10 o'clock on next Monday, and we're going to finish by, you said an hour? Yep. An hour? Yeah. So we'll give ourselves a little bit of extra time just for oopsies and whatnot, but so 90 minutes. And our height, let's give ourselves 200 feet. Just so we've got some buffer. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go in and we're going to choose our aircraft. So in this case, we're going to use the Mavic 3. Um, This is our Mavic 3 standard. It says Mavic 3E. The reason is when when Navdrone's a little slow at updating the types that are available to it, um, the 3E and the 3 are identical. The C number and the serial number match exactly the aircraft. It's just the description is is perfect. Um, But the weight is there. And we're going to go me... Okay, so then at the bottom here, do not enter. Any, so this this description is a description for you. It's not for Nav Canada, right? It's it's your description for when you're looking back at your records. So this is a sample. Not actually flown. 
Um, bold. Um, just whatever. So now I'm going to go back to the draw area. The other thing I can do is I can add a takeoff and landing point. And let's assume I've got two things here. I might fly some of this from, let's make that the takeoff and landing spot. And, and we also need to have an alternate. So maximum safe, minimum safe distance from people. We're using a Mavic 3. It has two things that are critical for this operation. We should just get it out of the way now. On the certificate of registration, the drone has a safety assurance declaration for controlled airspace operations. We would confirm that it's still on the list, not like some hotels at the moment. Um, we would also confirm, ideally, that it has a minimum safe distance from people that is uh, better than 100 feet, right? So basic operations, it's minimum is 100 feet. Better than 100 feet, I mean, like, it can go closer. So it can come down to 16.5 feet or 5 meters from, the, from a bystander. And the reason I want that in this situation is because we're taking off from a public space. We're going to define a 16 and a half foot radius circle around our initial takeoff. And then we should look for another spot that could potentially be 16 and a half foot radius or 32 feet for an emergency takeoff and landing spot. Like this is my alternate, right? So if I click on here and go drop another point, and let's say that over here, it's still visual line of sight, but this could be my emergency spot. And then all I'd have to do is make sure that there's either no people there at the time I want to use that spot or use my, it's, if someone's harassing me while I'm flying, I can at least go along the beach and land it there. Mm -hmm. Downside to that is it's a beach, it's going to be sandy, and it's probably going to fill the drone up with sand. So, so I have my spots. Um, in theory, I should be able to get visual on a site at least halfway out. I wouldn't say um, I'm going to be guaranteeing visual on a site all the way out. So... That's my second challenge. And the reason I asked you about whether or not I can join you on the boat is can I operate the drone from the boat while you're running it? Because then I could maintain visual line of sight and be close to the drone the entire time. If that's not the case, then I'm going to be limited somewhere around 500, maybe six, 700 meters. It's going to really depend on visibility conditions. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a second person come. So you're going to be my visual observer while Ben's running the boat. And that's going to enable me to have a little bit better, not necessarily stronger or farther distance, but a, a more constant visual lock on the drone while we're operating it. Because if you're going heads down the controller and then heads back up to the drone, heads down, and it's, hey, it's in controlled airspace, so it's potentially busy. And operating at farther distances with a noisy, a visually noisy backdrop behind the drone, so you think about where we are. Um, you've got the North Shore and everything above it is going to be our backdrop for the drone. It's going to be very difficult to maintain visual lock on the drone while going down, focusing on a controller, getting the shot, and then focusing back up. So in this case, I'd say a visual observer is pretty much mandatory for it. And that way also I could position the visual observer right out on the pier somewhere where maybe I can't operate the drone from, but they could be closer to the boat and maintain it. All that, Jen, you're going to need to have is we'll have a cell phone or a WhatsApp call or something going in real time or radio where you can talk to me and say, I can see the drone. Um, if you And this is part of the briefing process, but can you see any aircraft? So if there's an airplane not coming close to our area at 500 feet or less, or looks like it might be. And one good way to say is like, do the tires of the airplane look the same size as your drone? Mm. That means they're at the same altitude. That's bad. So um, if they're up at 1,000 plus feet, you just be like, I see one. I don't think it's a conflict. It's probably up 1,000 feet, but I'm watching it in case, right? Um, just so that we've got constant communication of where aircraft are. Uh, and then you tell me if they're coming into the area so that I can react. Because if I'm out 500 meters over water um, and it's maximum speed coming back is like two to three minutes, right? The airplane might be through the area before. So now we're in between, which is really bad. We do not want to be in that situation. So um, that's kind of a, a very loose Visual observer briefing. It's not the full one, but just we've just established that we need that. We've established our takeoff and landing spot. We've established a type of airspace. So at this point, I can hit save or val on this plan, and let's see what else it's going to tell us. Okay, so we've got our operation is saved. 
we've got some actions. So let's go through what NavDrone is telling us on the screen right now. So we've got our area of operation spelled out. We've got our operational parameters, drone, location, pilot, date and time. Um, on the right side, it's going to tell you any details in particular about it. So one of our car's requirements, if you go back here, is predominant weather conditions for the area of operation. We can go to the weather tab and get what the forecast is for the area. This is forecasted for now uh, and then the hours remaining in the day. It's not for the day you want to fly it. So it's here if you go back to this just before you launch, but it's not for next Monday. That's important to know. Um, but one of the cool things it has is KP index. So you can see right away if, if GPS is going to be a problem in the area as well. So that's one of the things that does affect drones. Of course, wind is going to be a big one. Um, it's in meters per second. This can be adjusted uh, to whatever your preference is. Um, but for the Mavic 3, the, the maximum wind speed is 10 meters per second. Actually, it's a little more, but if it's if if it's up there, that's 36 kilometers an hour. That's pretty pretty windy, so we would be considering that. Daylight time is great. It tells me when sunset is, so if I want to plan this, I'd, I'd put in for like 11 o'clock and you'd said sunset, so this is one opportunity for me to fix that. We'll just pretend we didn't. But the next thing it's going to be is airspace. It's grid. It doesn't tell you in NavDrone what type of airspace it is. So we're not too concerned, for example, in a flight review about what letter of airspace it is at this part, but... When we go to the map and charts reading section, we do ask you, like, what type of airspace is this, right? So you do need to understand that. Regulatory. So what applicable laws, right? This was back on uh, B, airspace class and regulatory requirements. So class of airspace, controlled. I'll tell you it's class C. Um, I don't think there's an easy way in drone to see it. I don't. To see the airspace class? I don't think so. No. So, and and... It's such a simple thing that could be added. Mm -hmm. You could just say Class C. There are other tools, like NRC Site Selection Tool does tell you it's Class C airspace. Nav, uh, Flight Plan Go, you can look at the actual Nav Canada charts. You can yeah. hopefully know that. Um, but for the purpose of what we're doing right now, like this is a practical site survey. Um, yeah, we don't expect you to have a VTA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, that's the name of the map. Yeah, that would show this. Exactly. So with some disclaimers, uh, the drone, if the drone is equipped with ELT, it cannot be operated because that would set off search and rescue. Um, if there's any ice accumulation, frost or snow adhering to any part of it, it cannot take off. Um, it's the pilot's responsibility to see and avoid aircraft at all times in both controlled and uncontrolled. These are kind of general rule statements for reminders. Contact Nav Canada immediately if the aircraft is no longer under your control. So if you're in a flyaway, contact Nav Canada. Or if it inadvertently enters into controlled airspace, well, we're already in controlled airspace. So in that case would be, did it go outside of your area of operation into more controlled airspace? Um, or if it goes into restricted class F, or if it's likely to go. So if it's on a flyaway and it's trucking along in a direction that's heading towards airspace, you need to call NAV Canada. Emergency contact number is going to be at the bottom of the report that we haven't seen yet. Um, or you can contact them from the flight information region. So a good phone number to remember is one eight six six WX brief B R I E F. Um, that is is the first number you could call if you had no other number that was better, right? It's it's the flight information center for your region. So for us, if we call, we get Kamloops Flight Information Center. They'll ask you, are you looking for weather? Are you here to report an emergency um, or flight planning services? You get a person on a desk. Um, it's not the best number, right? You're going to be, if you are in controlled airspace, you're going to be given the phone number to the tower of that controlled airspace. That's the number you should be calling first. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, because if you call Kamloops FIC, what they're going to do is they're going to determine where you are, and then they're going to transfer you to that number that you could have called. So then yeah. you've now just... Burn time. Now you've burned maybe, even if it's only 90 seconds, that's still 90 seconds where now... Maybe you lost sight of the drone in those 90 seconds. Exactly. Other disclaimers, no flights allowed when icing conditions. They set it twice, right, if it's sleet or snow or icing. Um, you're responsible for ensuring that their operations are compliant with all laws, right, so don't break the law, obvious. Um, close proximity to buildings or towers may experience radio frequency interference, so that's one that's good to know. Um, any ATC instructions, you need to comply with them. Flights above an altitude of 400 feet are only allowed if authorized by 
air traffic control. So one thing that we often see is there's uh, not a strong an awareness that you can fly above 400 feet with a 250 gram or larger drone in controlled airspace subject to approval of the air navigation service provider or the air traffic tower. Mm -hmm. The realities of it happening aren't as common, but... And if we were doing it with the drone that we're using today, above 400 feet, you wouldn't be able to maintain visual line of sight with the aircraft anyways. It would be a little tough. Yeah. It would be too small. Yeah. Realistically. Like you could... Same thing. Like if I'm saying 500 to 700 meters on a really good day with visual line of sight, um, that's that's pretty borderline. Yeah. Right? So you're, you're, you've got pretty heroic visual acuity at that point. Pilots must ensure they review all NOTAMs in the area. So NOTAMs, notices to airmen. They're, they're alert systems that are broadcast. So we've talked about this before. Nav drone will show you on the map the NOTAM of a CYR, so a restricted airspace that's been t temporarily spooled up, but it may not show you navigation hazards or other regulatory changes or routing changes or nav like beacon changes. Um, so to go to those, you got to go to the Collaborative Flight Planning Services, which is the plan.navcanada.ca slash WX recall. It's the only one. Today was the day that they discontinued AWWS. Oh, I know. Oh. I went to check AWWS this morning and it redirected to WX recall and I just started, and I was just so sad. Just pour one out. I know. <laughs> RIP. AWWS was what was it called? AWS? Aviation Weather Website. And it was the good one. And they so they discontinued it. Yeah. So OG uh pilots. Are gonna be. It was terrible. It was terrible. Like, it's better than the current one. The but current it, but one's it was, worse. Yeah. Okay. It was still terrible. Sorry, Dav Canada. I just, <laughs> from a web user experience, both of them have some work to do. Safety of the operation according no likely collision. That's of course your pilot responsibility. Safe for takeoff, landing, launch, recovery is suitable. Uh, weather conditions permit. Uh, familiar with available information relevant, RFPA is sufficient fuel or energy. So this comes back to 90123, which is your standard operating procedures. You can't take off if you don't have enough energy to finish the flight, right? So that's a no-brainer, but mm -hmm. it's, it happens. We've had a flight review where someone showed up with a battery that was almost dead, yep. immediately took off, and went into return to home. Yep. Uh, I, you can imagine how that flight review went. It was an unsatisfactory result of the <laughs> review for the candidate. <laughs> Please charge your batteries. <laughs> Each crew member has received appropriate instructions. So we had a preliminary briefing. We would continue that with, like, do you have any questions? Do you understand what your role is? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, positives. It's in with visual line of sight according to this because I told them it's in visual line of sight. It didn't test that for me. Mm -hmm. I could make the drone area of operation 1,400 meters, and it's like, looks good. That's still visual line of sight because I said it is. Mm -hmm. So don't take that for granted. Maximum takeoff weight is between 250 and 25. That's pulled from my flight information about the drone I chose for the job. If I had said it was 26 gram, kilograms, it would have warned me that I also need an SFOC for the job. But again, those are tools that are reminder tools, but not guaranteed. So I have a task. I have to submit this permission request um, via the task tab. And in order to do that, I have to publish it first. When I publish an operation, it's going to draw a polygon on a shared map but it doesn't give any more details about it. That's not public to everyone else. But if you were to come along or you were to come along and plan a mission at the same spot, it's going to warn you that there's a potential other drone operation in the area at the same time. So visual alert. That's if I'm picking the same time, exactly. same, day. same day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. So cool. hit publish. Good to know. So I still have that application. It's validated everything else about it. So all of this is sufficient. I go to tasks. Now I have an action required task, right? So this one is where I would get permission. Now this is the same for both automated approvals and for manual approvals at this point. But what I can do is I can click on view details and this is gonna go to CZVR, which is Vancouver Center Sentry. Um, so that's the person responsible for all RPAS requests in that region. Date, uh, airspace, like that's your file number for it. And if I go to view details, it's going to show me the type that it is. It's a manual approval. So that means that a person's going to get a ping and they're going to say, "There's this person wants to fly this drone at this location at this. What else do I need? And that would start the timer. So I'm going to hit submit. It's going to ask me some questions about the operation. So this is now going back to my standard operating procedures, right? So 
at maximum operation altitude and distance, what's the process and time required to terminate the flight? How are you going to get the drone back to wherever it took off from in the event of emergency? So this is this is an interesting question. So if you're flying over the water, technically the easiest way to terminate the flight is to go sticks up, and then the drone's in the water. Yeah, but I want my drone back. But Nav Canada doesn't care about that. <laughs> I want my drone back. It's three grand. <laughs> so when they're saying this, do they mean like do they mean like if you terminate the flight immediately, how long is it gonna to take to land? Or are they talking about how long would it take to return to home in the event of an emergency? So you have a choice, mm -hmm. and that's what this drop down is. Um, right. I'm going to return to home because I do want my three thousand dollar investment back. Mm -hmm. So um, at maximum distance is about a kilometer. It comes back at about fifteen meters per second, I think, in return to home. So um, let's say two to three minutes. Could could they deny you based on that choice? No. Oh. Uh, I say no because I've never been. Okay. I think it's more they're just asking. What's your how plan? much time or how much notice okay. do you need? Um, I've not actually talked to them about this, but my understanding is this is more, we need to know if we were giving you notice that you, need to, you need to get down now. Yeah. Like the airspace is closed. They're calling me on the phone saying, get your drone out of the air. The airspace is closed. How much time is it going to take you to get on the ground? Okay. Right? So if I tell you it's going to take 25 minutes to abort my mission, that would probably be a red flag to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But realistically, three minutes is, is more than reasonable. Um, the next question is pre program re re behavior, which is the same. It's other, but now my controller loses link. What's the drone going to do? In this situation, if I'm taking off from land, I want the drone to return to home. So I'm going to configure it during my pre flight to return to home. If I was taking off from a boat, I'd want it to hover. I wouldn't want it to return to home and I wouldn't want it to land because water bad. So, um, I'm going to set it to return to home. I do have options to land immediate land and uh, alternates new. Uh, hover and wait to reacquire signal return to home. So they've, they've got a few more options here. But in this case, we're returning home. It will be the same because it's the same distance at maximum. Right? If the operation requires an SFOC, this is where you will put the number. We don't need one because we're not flying overweight. We're not flying beyond visual line of sight. We're not flying over height in Class G airspace. We're not flying a suspended load. We're not flying. An over an event. event, yeah. So, um, and we're not releasing anything. So, hopefully, now you have an option for remarks for Nav Canada. Uh, this field really is just used for referencing a previous request. All right. So, if you get denied on your initial request and they say re request with this, um, you can reference that number. Although, um, I really don't know what else to put in here other than like high Steve. There's, there's not, um, They'll tell you what they want on your subsequent request. So, and if you're using Google Earth to draw out a really elaborate plan, or if this is an advanced operation or an SFOC, you can attach your SFOC or the rest of your operation here into the upload. So that would be a good place to put it. Um, it's just it could be PDFs or JPEGs. That's just supporting documents. Yeah, exactly. So, but at this point, that's all I need. I'm gonna hit OK. Because this is manual, it's now going to send an email. They're going to see this. It's going to say this person is wanting to do this. And then it'll either be approved or denied, and it'll move to the resolved side. I'm going to cancel this. I don't actually want to fly this job, and I don't want to create workload for Nav Canada. That's not necessary. So, so if they deny it, do they send you information on what was denied from your request? And can you then... Um revise that request to try and fit the parameters that they're looking for? Yeah. So if you send something really elaborate, you might get a phone call. Right. Um, if you send something that is easily be resolved, in their opinion, based on altitude, you'll get an email back saying conflicts with whatever, reapply at this altitude. Okay. Right. So before this polygon change happened on the map, um, downtown Vancouver used to be a grid system. And for example, we did a flight. We have a site survey video about this, uh, for Granville street bridges. I think it's only on our, our coastal monthly. It's not a public video, but, um, we were operating Granville street bridge. And one of the concerns was elevation and height. We needed more than hundred feet. We were only able to get hundred feet. And so basically I kept getting denied based on a conflict with the medevac path for uh, Vancouver General Hospital, mm. so for the helicopters there. So at least they tell you what the issue is so yeah. you can try and 
yeah, we'll get around, around it. it. Yeah. yeah. So um, in this case, though, what would have happened if it were approved is I would have got back an auto. If it were automatically approved, I'd say it automatically would say this is approved. And my flight approval request would come through here on the document side. Or, or sorry, not here, but under um, flight report. I don't think this one's going to let me. Yeah, because it's not fully approved. There's no information about it. It's just canceled. So you canceled it. Will they still get an email and then they'll just get a subsequent email saying it was canceled? Or? I think so. Yeah. I think no one's ever called me and complained. I've yeah. done this quite a few times. Yeah. Please don't. <laughs> Let's not all do this. Um, I'm doing it for your benefit. Uh, this one was allowed. This was an auto approved. This was a new West. So only difference here is this one is, is class G airspace. So it was auto approved, but it didn't even need to go through as an approval. But one of the cool things you can do is, so the flight report, and this is, this is kind of wrapping up the site survey. Um, the flight report can be your documented site survey. Um, it can also, for the most part, be a site survey as required for the flight review purposes. There are some things in here that aren't quite, right? So crew briefing, um, maps and symbols, apparently now. <laughs> so, but it has all my details of the flight, the location, the date. It gives you the boundaries of the operation. If you use a circle, it'll give you every lat long point for the circle, so there'll be two or three pages of coordinates. So I don't recommend doing that. Um, and then if this was authorized by NAV drone, the flight information would be here as well as the phone number that you need to call for that mission. Yeah. If if it's required, not every controlled airspace will want you to, to phone them that you're taking off, but many of them will. Exactly. And then it'll also, I think it also has the phone number in case of an emergency. Yes, at the very bottom it says, in the event of flyaway, call this phone number. Yep. Okay. Um, all right, so the site survey is complete. Um, we should go back to the nav drone chart. Is that really where we want to end this? Because we've, we've used nav drone for this. Should we switch over to flight plan, or is that in the scope of what you wanted? Because I feel like you have some ulterior I didn't have any ulterior snags or anything. Uh, <laughs> no ulterior snags. You're not just, setting me up for this? No, I just wanted to show the, the new polygons. That was why I picked this location. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, since we've got everyone here, um, well, I haven't checked the chat in a while. <laughs> Is everyone still here? Yeah, there's people here, and hopefully... Um, Is there a chat message? Let's see. This is a chat message. What is the phone number again, please? Uh, phone number... Oh, 1866... We're talking about for weather brief one eight six six W X B R I E F. Put in the chat there as well. Uh, thanks for asking. Okay, well, let's just open up flight plan and let's look at the same spot as uh, where we're going. And so, flight plan is a free resource. Flight plan is a free resource. It's offered by Garmin and it has it is an electronic mm -hmm. version of the visual navigation charts that Finn has unceremoniously dropped. And we're going to jump right to digital charts. There's two things that you need to know and how to use for aviation knowledge. It's the CFS, the Canada Flight Supplement, and the digital charts. We're going to focus right on the digital charts, but you would also find that in here. Mm -hmm. Another video to come, I'm sure. So we're going to go to sectionals. You don't need to log in for this, by the way. And we're going to go to, I have another massively long video just on how to read maps and charts. It's on our blog. I think it's one of our more common videos I've had. Helicopter pilots tell me they use it as well, so that's kind of cool. Um, but this is Canada VNCs and VTAs up top, and then the FAA-issued um, sectionals on the bottom. So let's zoom in to where we were. I am lost. There we go. Come on. Double-click to zoom. And you go so far, it just goes white. Okay, so that's as far as I can zoom in. So there's kits. Um, is there anything else on the map that's going to be a problem that's not showing up on nav drone? I don't think so. Yeah, not not in the area that we're going to be. If we were closer to downtown, you see those triangles? Those are obstructions. Yeah, towers. Towers, cell towers, or um, bridge um, posts or something like that. Yeah. So the, <clears throat> and then you'll see the altitude, or sorry, the elevation and the height above ground in there, right? Mm -hmm. So in brackets is the height above ground. The uh, outside number is the elevation above sea level. So 375 height above ground. These are basically buildings, right, is what all these are. So 
you can see the average building height is about six to seven hundred feet, or sorry, four hundred to seven hundred feet there. That's probably the Harbor Tower is one of the taller ones there. One thing to point out though is these uh, hexagons all over the place. These are VFR call points. If an aircraft is directed by control towers to go to a point, that is the point they're likely to be directed to go to. So there's the Jericho call point that's right over the water. Mm. Um, if you, and this is actually a really good one. If you're operating in this area, we didn't talk about this at all. What's the radio frequency for this controlled airspace? Oh, uh, it's decimal uh, four. So yeah, if we zoom up here on the map, you look at where this big box is. Um, Vancouver Harbor Tower is 118.4, and that's where the C for Class C airspace is as well. As you'll see it along the box border here, it says Control Zone C from surface to 2500. If you have a scanner, it would be a good idea to have it tuned to 118.4 on the radio frequency, and then have your ears tuned for anyone saying the words midpoints, Jericho, point gray, 1,000 along the shoreline towards Kitts, False Creek, uh, which is not a call point, but it is local knowledge. False Creek is in there in Vancouver. Oh, I did it again. Um, because those, when your ears are tuned to that, and perhaps maybe your VO is doing that for you, your visual observer, uh, that's going to give you a warning about there being potential conflict or of aircraft in the area. So, for example, helicopters are flying these dark blue arrows back and forth on the North Shore, and then they go over to Lionsgate. They'll fly to Third Beach and then down to Falls Creek when they're doing helicopter city tours, and they do it at 1,600 feet. Shouldn't yeah. be a conflict, but could be. If I'm, doing, if I'm doing the same tour in an airplane, I'd go Second Narrows, Point Atkinson, Third Beach, downtown, and then Second Narrows again. Wow. Look at you. Better <laughs> tour. Wow. <laughs> yeah, then you do like three to four orbits over downtown. Back to pit takes about forty minutes, and it costs one third of the cost. It costs one third <laughs> of the cost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Burn a bit more fuel in a helicopter. Uh -huh. um, but we get to go slower, and you get to see more. Mm. So there. Pop it into slow flight flaps thirty. Helicopters Actually, that, are cooler. That's illegal. <laughs> I didn't say that. That was what I just described. It's unlawful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the. We wanted to wrap on the VNC VTA um, real quick. I know we're getting real close on time. We'll probably be a little over, but. Let's uh, end the screen share and ask any questions of anyone in the group if you've got them. Well, I feel like for me, I'm still just for the site survey. Like it says maps. So am I writing down that I've looked at the map, that I understand the symbols? Like I think just for me, I just need a bit more clarification. And second question, follow up. Is that now going to be on the flight review? Well, the maps and symbols is part of the flight, the flight review. review yeah. but. For the site survey, am I going to have to write that in my site survey saying I've read over the map? Here's the challenge. So cars are the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The AIM is an interpretation slash information adder. Mm -hmm. It's not a legally binding document. Mm. I don't know like, if the words it's not legally binding. I know. Is this, yeah. Like this is okay. This is I, I am not a lawyer. Yeah. First off, I am just a guy that is a drone nerd and I've, I've been proven wrong many times. So I guess I'm just asking because the site survey that I've made up doesn't have. Well, it doesn't say like I have. If someone arrives to me for a flight review, normally one of the questions I'll ask, well, I'll ask a couple questions. What class of airspace is this? What mm -hmm. tool did you use to determine that? If that person gives me nav drone, if that person gives me the NRC site selection tool, if that person hands me a VTA, I consider that as the flight reviewer to have met the standard for, for looking at the class of airspace. Yeah. Um, Would you consider that for looking at the site survey then, I guess? You yeah, I, I'd say so, yeah. Because okay. and then like because those, you know, I've used those tools. I'm comfortable with those tools. Um, and I know that those are those are official maps and um, and that they're fairly easy to interpret. Normally, when I'm asking map reading questions, I do it about the CFS because that's the one that people struggle with sure. more. Yeah, I, I find and sorry, I've got my laptop muted just so we don't have feedback. So if you guys do have a question, please just raise your hand and I'll unmute real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, Drew's got a question. Uh, what I was going to say just before we do that, though, is you need to know what type of airspace you're in. If you can black and white know what that is and know what the regulatory requirements are, as long as the tools are using support that, that's, that's what the process should be. Sorry, Drew, go ahead. 
now when I do flight reviews, I have a VTA with me and I make the candidates show uh, show me where that we are uh, and then show me the um, airspace stack because where I am is fairly unique. Uh, there's um, three different classes of airspace above us <clears throat> from the RC field we fly out of. So um, they can pinpoint our location and show me where on that VTA chart shows them what class we're in, then that's okay. If they can't do that, then that, that's not going to be a pass. Yeah, it's reasonable. If they're using a published aviation tool, one of those tools, then, then definitely that's a, a good option for it. Mm -hmm. The reason why I don't necessarily love it when someone brings a VTA is that I have to ask them, is this v VTA currently valid? Because then if if um if it's not, if it's an expired VTA, then you, it cannot be used. So, yeah. Mm. True. Yeah, I guess just making sure you hit all your points on your site survey now. Mm -hmm. Bill, have you got a question? Or you just... I was just going to make a suggestion. I carry my iPad with me when I uh, go flying and I keep ForeFlight on it. And it has all that information right there. It's current. And you've got good measuring tools right at your fingertips. Yeah, and that's pulling directly from a certified nav drone source. As long as your your subscription is valid, we use that for commercial operations all day. No, it's a good. I found it to be a great tool. You can use the ruler feature, and just if you're a little bit outside of a control zone, you take the ruler and you say, "Okay, I'm three point two nautical miles outside your control zone," and it'll give you a magnetic heading. I read them right at your fingertips. I find it a great tool. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, Drew, you're quiet again there. Uh, the other thing is uh, I use RPASS Wilco. Now, I'm a Mac member. Uh, I was using RPASS Wilco since it initiated. Um, it, to me, NavDrone should have been built after or used RPASS Wilco because it really is a complete package. Uh, now it's only available to Mac members. Um, but it's, uh, it's a really, if you've never seen it, you should uh, find somebody to give you a package or I could send you a package they send you. It's a very, very complete package for uh, doing a flight servo, particularly in class G. Um, I fly a lot up at the, on the Bruce Peninsula in a little harbor up there. So uh, it's great for that, but it, it really is a very comprehensive package. Yeah, I've, I've done quite a few. I'd say 20, 30% of the reviews, I've seen people use RPAS Wilco for both basic and advanced operations. Um, I've also seen people use Drone Pilot Canada, Nav Drone, purely use the VNC's VTAs. That's those are pretty much it these days. Uh, fly safe, not as common, but it's another option. There's there's UAV forecast if you're just looking for weather. There's no problem with using any of those tools as long as you can trust and verify, right? So if you have a way to know the data is good and that it makes sense and there's no regulatory concerns with it, then like Finn was mentioning with the VTAs, they can they can go out of date. Airspace probably won't change too much, but again, like we're in the digital age with, nav, with, with drones, so now drone is going to give you what's specific to the drone regulations, but then you are operating in an advanced environment that is in proximity to traditional manned aviation. So you do need to know where the hazards are. That's why we, we still always pull up a VTA and give them some sort of spot reference on it. Yeah, and I'm just coming, I, I only mentioned that because I come from manned aircraft where using an expired VTA or VNC is a car's violation. Exactly. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's straight up is a car's violation. So like, I don't, if someone brings me an out of date one, I might just like, I don't know if I would fail them for that. Because it hasn't happened before, but I would be a little bit not Ian, annoyed. not Ian checking. <laughs> this one is current. Uh, are you sure about that? Yes. How do you know? Because uh, it's got a number on it. It's edition forty-eight, and then you go and you Google uh, nav. He's uh, pulling up receipts, you guys. Nav, yeah, I am. I am now. Uh, yeah. Nav Canada map validity. You look at the VFR chart list, and um, I had to do this for my CPL test. Um, <laughs> Because the examiner asked me, how do you know? Yeah. Anyways, I would then look in this um thing. It's not downloading because of the, the reception in this room. We're in a Faraday cage. Yeah, it isn't spectacular. But then I would go look and I would see that Vancouver is uh, edition 48, which this is the one from last summer. Uh, and in the most I've ever seen them update them is once a year. Um, unless and, there's something dramatic that's changed. Mm. Yeah, unless there's been a huge change. Yeah. Cool. Hi, Brian. Hi there. Um, our pass Wilco is available to non Mac members at this point. It was acquired by the people who own uh, Alto Helix and our pass center. 
So there's three versions. There's a free version, there's a $3 a month version, and then there's an enterprise version. Um, and it has, as far as I know, it's the only uh, site survey assistant or whatever that actually has a Nav Canada subscription. So the charts and CFS information really is from Nav Canada. Um, I prefer Drone Pilot Canada app that has a ton of features in addition. Um, like, uh, for example, it gives you, you know, nearest airports, directions, whatever. There's an emergency checklist where if you have a flyaway, you can push a couple buttons on your phone and you get the phone number of the airport and, and a script to actually tell the airport, you know, where your drone is, where it's coming from and so on. Um, the downside with Drone Pilot Canada is it uses charts from Skyvector, which are American and the American charts were all skeletonized some time ago. Um, so they wouldn't be legal for for uh, Canadian operations. A lot of stuff is missing. They appear to have CFS info, but they don't. So they don't have the, uh, the little footnotes in the CFS where you might find things about drones, uh, circuit directions, you know, stuff like that. So, but other than the sky vector issue, uh, it's a really handy little app. It's quick and, and immediate and sends you a printout, which you can print or, you know, keep on your iPad, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got a complete, some sort of PDF or something like we love, like, and we didn't really say this, like there is no, there's no written requirement that you conduct a hard copy site survey for normal operations. You can do it verbally. You can do your cursory through just using the tools, but having that proof that you've done your site survey is going to satisfy your uh, checklist requirements in 901.23. So it is kind of a chicken and egg thing. Mm -hmm. um, how do you prove you've done your site survey other than redoing it right in front of the inspector again mm -hmm. and then finding out you didn't do it and or we're completely wrong? That's going to be really awkward. So it's a lot of CYA there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, NavDrone just proves that you've done this site survey. RPAS Wilco, Drone Pilot Canada, all these other ones are going to have way more information. They are They are like multiple pages more information in comparison. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there are great tools out there. Um, and you just, unfortunately right now, the, the only one that's official that can do flight authorization requests is nav, is nav drone. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they open up the application programming interface eventually and more better tools and you get a competitive market in place. It would be great. So there's, was there like 16 in the U S that mm -hmm. can do land C. So yeah, there's, it's a completely different uh, landscape out here. Mm -hmm. The All US right. has um, Lanc C APIs so that you can make an app that can get into the air, controlled airspace system. And uh, Nav Canada, Nav Drone doesn't have an API. So the um, apps up here can't access, get permission for access to controlled airspace. That's correct. Yeah. They, they have not opened it up to the public or to other markets yet. There's been discussions about it, but nothing official. I've done ops in uh, military class E and um, uh, nav drone will come up and say, you need permission from the uh, owner of the airspace or words to that effect because they don't own the airspace. So if you're a military class E, then uh, you really have to contact, you know, the base. There'll be some phone number for wing ops or something like that. And you can, you know, track your way down to somebody who will approve. Uh, exactly. So just a comment. Yeah. All right. I want to stay on time. So I really appreciate you guys piping in. I know this is a long one. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll have this up on the chat as a replay pretty quick automatically. And then in four or five weeks, the cut down version goes to YouTube. YouTube. So we'll see it there. Yeah. So if, <laughs> if you're on YouTube and you're watching this, this happened about four or five weeks ago. Um, thank you for watching this live on YouTube. Well, not live, recorded on YouTube. Hit that like and subscribe button. We really appreciate that. We want to grow the channel and we'll be coming out with new content every week. Thank you for everyone here now live and we'll see you next week.